Good evening and welcome back to the Real Science Exchange, Balkim's podcast or pubcast, as it was lovingly named by Dr. Mike Hutchins a few weeks ago, is where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Tonight, we have a real treat for our listeners, two industry icons coming together to discuss climate change one of the biggest challenges of our lifetime, and how the dairy industry is going to step up to the challenge by achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts for tonight's conversation. Our guests tonight really need very little introduction. First, Dr. Frank Mittlerner. Frank is a professor and air quality specialist from the University of California, Davis, and director of the CLEAR Center, a research and communications group helping our global community understand the environmental and human health impacts of livestock. He filled the first ever UC Davis position, focusing on the relationship between livestock and air quality nearly 20 years ago. Our second guest is Dr. Mike McCluskey. Mike, a veterinarian by training, is the co-founder and CEO of Select Milk Producers, the sixth largest milk cooperative in the country. He's chairman of the board for Fair Oaks Farms, a highly visited agritourism destination in Northwest Indiana, and one of the innovators behind Fair Life Milk Products. Mike also serves as chairman of the Innovation Center for the U.S. Dairy Environmental Stewardship Committee and has done so since it started in 2010. Good evening, gentlemen, and welcome to our pub. Frank, you've been uh, with us before at the Real Science Lecture Series, but this is your first time here at the Exchange. In keeping with our theme, what's in your glass tonight, and what should our listeners know about you? Well, let's start with the easy one. What's in my glass? <laughs> uh, this is a Chardonnay, a Sonoma Cotrea Chardonnay from Sonoma County here in California. What should they know about me? Well, they should know that I really care about uh, about facts, and I'm appalled by hearing a lot of the stuff that's being reported about livestock that's just not factual. And so got my work cut out for me. Mike, I understand you're in Puerto Rico right now. And according to the Weather Channel, it's now 78 degrees. But with the wind chill, it actually feels like it's 82. I'm not sure how that works. But uh, <laughs> so tell, tell, us, tell us what you're drinking tonight. Perhaps one thing that maybe our listeners don't know about you. Well, uh, yeah, so normally... I would be drinking my Fair Life milk with a little Tito's vodka, which is a nice drink that I like to have at the end of the day. And here in Puerto Rico, it is the end of the day. We were uh, here on our farm, so I'm here in Puerto Rico. And because it's a special occasion tonight, I thought I'd do one of my have one of my special drinks. So I brought a, one of our coconuts from the farm. I uh, had one of our people at the farm help me with a machete. I didn't do this part, but I brought one of the coconuts. One of our uh, grapefruits, and then some of our special rum from here in Puerto Rico, Don Q, one of the best rums in Puerto Rico, and it's uh, uh, Don Q Gold here with Don Q Cocoa, and then a little coconut shavings, and it makes a uh, wonderful tropical drink that's not too sweet, and it has a great rum taste to it, so cheers to everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Just cheers. Cheers. <laughs> cheers. I think it's true what my wife always says. I'm a simple man with simple needs. <laughs> <laughs> Not like you, Mike. <laughs> Mike, if you'll, if you'll forward that recipe, I'll put it in the show notes and, and share it with our well, audience. Well, I'll be glad to forward it. It's delicious. Yeah, that'd be awesome. When I found out that you were in Puerto Rico, I was reminded that you guys had a terrible hurricane there a few years ago that devastated the island as well as the dairy industry. Can you give us kind of an idea of how the dairy industry has rebounded since then? Yeah, it was Maria, uh, September 17, so it's been now quite a while, but it was uh, devastating, truly devastating. Uh, beautiful to see how USDA came into the support. Uh, National Milk actually uh, did a lot of work, play at National Milk, did just a phenomenal job of uh, getting help down here immediately. You know, we had to bring uh, different types of feeds. Uh, there was just nothing, no electricity. Uh, it took... Um, Thank God, a lot of the dairy farmers with their generators. So, and then the ones that didn't, there was some help to, to try to get generators to them, but still some weren't able to. So you could imagine 
Uh, a lot of cows, uh, unfortunately, didn't make it through a storm like that, but they have rebound tremendously. So everyone's kind of, the, the industry is vibrant. It's one of the few agricultural products that are self-sufficient in Puerto Rico. Um, you know, a lot of import of beef and other, other agricultural products, but the dairy industry is very, very strong. Uh, great dairy farmers, uh, very dedicated to their animals, uh, beautiful pasture farms. Uh, it's just a, a very nice industry. I'd, I'd also like to point out that uh, if, if, you're, if you're listening to this on the podcast form, you might want to go to the YouTube and see where Mike's uh, located right now. I see palm trees in the background, and uh, out my window I see snow, Mike. So I, 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 I just very envious of where you're at at the moment. I'll be um, back, I'll be back in, in, in Indiana to, uh, in two days. So uh, <laughs> Clay is with us once again, uh, my co-host, and he's in his usual seat tonight. Clay, you having the usual? I am. I'm having a hard cider again. All right. Yeah. So uh, I understand that uh, the Angry Orchard has several flavors. Do you ever switch it up or is it always the same? It's usually the same. This is the crisp apple, but I, but I've tried the others, so some of the others are good. I, I like some of the ciders that aren't even apples sometimes. Some of the other fruits are really good. Very nice. Well, tonight I'm enjoying a an Elijah Craig, which is, a, is kind of my go-to, one of my go-to bourbons. Before we get started, I'd, I'd really like to raise my glass to a couple icons to the industry and, and, and thank you guys for joining us tonight. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. So, Frank, uh, to get us started, would you mind uh, framing up what net zero carbon emissions is and, and what does it mean to the dairy industry? There are different definitions, okay? There are, there are different um, schemes, so to say. There's the net net zero carbon and uh, and mike would be probably uh, the best to talk about that um i i am uh, very much preferring a a climate neutrality path for animal agriculture and what i mean by that is that i am personally uh, most interested in the dairy beef and other industries uh, becoming neutral in how they produce to our climate so I'm actually looking at the warming impacts of agriculture and not just the CO2 equivalent, that's what it's called, the CO2 equivalent reduction. Um, and the reason for that is that um, if you look at climate neutrality, then you have a path forward by which uh, an industry can be climate neutral. So, for example, you can do calculations that if the industry were to go down on methane over the next 10 or 20 years, how long it would take for, let's say, the dairy industry to not have any negative impact on climate anymore. And to me, this is really um, a very positive, a very encouraging approach because it gives people hope that this negative discussion around livestock and climate uh, will come to an end. If we, if we want to be to net zero by 2050 or neutral, where are we today in relation to that? You know, how, how far do we really have to go? And it's kind of hard for me to kind of visualize that. It gets technical quickly, okay? But I'm just boiling it down now uh, to, the, to the bare essential. There are several greenhouse gases, one of which is methane, and that's really the, the 800 pound gorilla. People oftentimes treat methane as if it were uh, behaving the same way as other greenhouse gases, but it doesn't. Because in contrast to other greenhouse gases, methane is not just produced, but methane is also destroyed. And that's a natural process, okay? And that has been undervalued, that destruction process, in the regulatory process so far. What makes this so special is that if we manage to further decrease methane, then we induce a process called negative warming. And negative warming is a fancy word for cooling. So in California, we have a new law that mandates a 40% reduction, 4-0, a 40% reduction of methane to be achieved by the year 2030. A 40% reduction, that's really a tall order, okay? And when, when that rule came out, that law came out, our dairy farmers went berserk. They thought, well, how in the world can we do this? But the state of California did something smart. They incentivized the reduction of methane through... Uh, co-sponsoring uh, covered lagoons, anaerobic digesters, alternative manure management practices, and so forth. And these financial incentives were so strong that farmers really jumped onto that. And now that we are three years in this new law, we have seen a 25% reduction of methane in the state of California um, attributed to our dairy industry entirely. 
25%. So we have a goal of 40%. We are over halfway there already. And that means we are well on the path to climate neutrality as we speak. And I have no doubt that by 2030, we will achieve that 40% reduction. Mike, how did you get started down the path toward uh, net zero carbon? And, and what does it mean to, to, to you as a dairy producer? Back in, in you said 2002 or earlier, um, but it, it was 2007 when we really got together as an industry under the leadership of, of DMI to come together and, and discuss uh, climate change and, and what would be our role in climate change. And, and the first thing we had to do is, is kind of figure out what is our impact, you know, put some science behind the whole conversation. Uh, you know, back then, I think most people would have been looking at transportation and others, but there was a bigger impact of, of the entire value chain. So we did an LCA, a life cycle assessment, and we used the University of Michigan and the University of Arkansas as our, as our researchers. And this, this is a great program of over 500 dairy farms nationwide, spread out through the entire country, were involved in this. And, and uh, long story short there, we ended up uh, understanding where are the critical points of our global warming effect, if you want to think about it that way, or our carbon production effect. Uh, and that way we were able to start saying, okay, where, what, how do we implement practices, technologies, incentives to be able to start a reduction of this process? So at the dairy farm level, we ended up uh, with approximately about 10 pounds of carbon per gallon of milk. That, that's basically what the LCA told. So give or take a, a half of a percent there. And, and that was average for the country, um, but on the, Total LCA, we were we were close to, closer to uh, uh, 17 pounds, and which would be the entire value chain all the way to cradle to grave. Would be the entire 17 pounds would come from that. But the farming side um, was another big portion. So I'd say there's about two and a half pounds. So if you take the farming and you take the dairy itself, you combine those two, it's about 70 percent of the total. Uh, carbon emissions uh, equivalent on a dairy. So we really, really focused on understanding where where that exactly was coming. Like Frank mentioned, you know, methane is a is a big portion of the carbon footprint of a dairy farm, and it comes uh, both in enteric methane. So this is methane that animals will comes from their digestive tract directly, be it through belching, but mainly through belching, and then manure management. So as animals defecate and urinate, we tend to collect this manure, depending on the type of farms, and we put them in in uh, storage areas, and those storage areas uh, create at some level in that storage an anaerobic condition, and that starts creating methane, and that methane would bubble up and, and go to atmosphere. So that uh, was part of what was being measured together with the enteric methane. And that was a lion's share of those 10 pounds. We also obviously had uh, you know, electrical uh, uh, carbon costs. The majority of it on the dairy farm is produced through through either enteric or manure methane. Like Frank said, the California focused on these digesters. We immediately started focusing on a national basis on digesters. The issue is, as Frank pointed out very clearly, California did the right thing that not only did they mandate, they incentivized. And they incentivized in a big way. They did this really smart, and, and, and it's what we've been trying to treat, achieve through our net zero initiative on a national basis, is that we have to get these incentives in the right place to be able to allow the dairy farmer to invest in the technology to be able to reduce these, these gases. As we all know, if we live in a commodity business, this is, you know, farming is... Uh, has some good years, but has a lot of bad years. So we can't expect for farmers to make these great investments if there's not some return. So how do you get a return? You know, it's not only through incentives. You got to innovate. You got to create new products, and these new products have values, uh, such as fertilizer products. You have avoidance costs that you can create on a farm. So you're spending certain amount of money doing things, and if you figure out a better technology to do it better and cheaper, that's an avoidance cost, or at least part of that cost you can apply against the technology, together with some income from a product, together with some incentives. The low carbon fuel standards in California is a is a perfect incentive. So if we produce a gas, biogas, which is about 60% methane. And we use technology to clean that to 99% methane, which now mimics natural gas. Uh, 
we can sell that into the gas line and into the low carbon fuel standards and it brings a very good price you know it varies it could be forty dollars a decatherm and that really helps pay for all this technology and allows for a reasonable return for the dairy farmer for adding this to his operation while doing mitigation at the level that frank mentioned i mean when you start talking about reducing your carbon footprint by 30 40 percent which you can do if, if you have a digester and if you do other management tools with enteric methane you can get to that fairly quick and get to what you know frank is i really love frank's approach to carbon neutrality which is you know different than net zero uh you know in the explanation that frank gave us it really is saying today as an industry we produce so much carbon if we cause these reductions we now are getting to be neutral where if, although we may be growing in size a little bit but we reduced a bunch over here our total carbon output is neutral or not affecting that the climate continues to uh, have issues with with uh, more uh, co2 or uh, in the atmosphere because we're not contributing to that right we're not adding to it we are carbon neutral to lowering that carbon it to me it's a pathway it's a beginning pathway to net zero but I, I i still am a big believer in the focus on net zero i believe that that uh we can get there uh, mm -hmm. i think we'll be there in a lot of dairies by by 2030 and i think as an industry we'll more than hit our goal of 2050. now not everyone not every farm may be net zero but some will be sequestrating carbon or be you know uh, negative in, in their carbon production and some will get close as an aggregate, as an entire industry with all the initiatives that we have laid out um, and everything that we're working on right now. Uh, and with some changes in policy and incentives, but also with creation of new product through better technologies, uh, we are showing uh, many models that will take us there hopefully before 2050 as an industry to net zero. I think this is really important, uh, Mike. What you're describing there is, um, is really a path um, by which the dairy industry can move into a uh, into a place where they will be viewed as a solution provider. There are only two sectors in society that can that can function as a, a source, but also a sink, and that's forestry and agriculture, because plants take on carbon during photosynthesis. So, for example, if you plant trees, then these trees will suck carbon out of the atmosphere. So that's a net reduction of carbon. If you are a dairyman and you have a lagoon that you now cover and you trap the biogas, as Mike described, and you're now converting that into fuel like renewable natural gas, which then powers vehicle fleets that now no longer burn diesel, but this renewable natural gas, then you are generating one of the most carbon negative fuel types there is. And that means you're, you're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. So agriculture and forestry are the only two sectors in society that have the potential to reduce carbon emissions. And we need to incentivize that. We need to uh, foster that uh, in any way we can, because farmers, in addition to just producing food, which of course is essential and unbelievably important, also can provide this very important bio uh, service to society. Um, and, and I think that we have to emphasize that. You know, we, uh, to add to Frank's point there, and one of the things that we've achieved through our Net Zero initiative, um, we have a FFAR grant for, for quite a bit of dollars. It's in the millions, 10, $12 million plus our matching money towards that with participation, not only of the dairy industry, but many of uh, of, our, of our, the processors and branded companies that are investing with us uh, and putting up money for this. And we have a, a research that will uh, go on. It's about a six year uh, program. I think it's a, we have 18 locations nationwide spread out over the entire country, which is going to measure exactly this sec sequestration. The science on it is not a, it's not a perfect science yet. We, we talk about no till, we talk about cover crops, we talk about crop rotations, we talk about this sequestration that we think we can mimic the forest that Frank just shared with us. And, and we, you know, I believe strongly we can. Uh, most models are showing maybe uh, uh, three quarters of a ton of carbon sequestered 
Others show maybe a ton and a half. I think we can get up higher than that. Uh, I think through the research and through technologies and practices that we will get up uh, hopefully into the two to two and a half tons sequestered per acre uh, through this type of management and, and even some gene editing and other things that we can do with plants that we, we would use cover crops with gene editing. The, the Salk Institute is working on this research as we speak that uh, enhances then the amounts of carbon that these, that these uh, cover crops will sequest, sequester during their period of, of, of uh, serving as a, you know, uh, protecting against erosion and doing their service as a cover crop, they can also uh, enhance the amount of carbon they're sequestering. So there's gonna be a bunch of practices uh, that we will continue to develop that I believe will enhance the, our ability to be able to sequester uh, a tremendous amount of carbon per acre of, of land that we're using to feed our cows. And then if you take what, again, what Frank was mentioning about a digester and offsetting a fossil fuel that was being used for fuel, digesters can take uh, what we call substrates, which is just any other carbon source that's out there that was going to a landfill or being land applied, we can take that into the digester. And in our digesters, I've doubled the amount of gas that we're producing with very little because the beauty about a manure digester is it's a perfect balance for bacteria. So, so you, you, it, it's you know, a great pH, great nutrient feed. It's just a great source. So when you bring in a, a carbon source of of waste, waste uh, food waste or something like that, it's like putting gasoline on a fire. So it doesn't take a lot of, of carbon source to bring into a digester that's running very well to double that gas. So when you double that gas, now you've offset another, you know, amount fossil fuel being used for, for, for these fuels by having this gas. So the, the combination of sequestering, using these digesters, managing the dairy cow through, um, you know, there's there's feed additives. Frank Frank has done a lot more work than I have on this, but on, there's feed additives that reduce the amount of uh, enteric methane that a cow would belch uh, up to probably 30 percent. I think that's a conservative number. If you look at the research of certain products, they, they can show up to 40, and and they last. It's not like it goes away. A lot of rumens get used to certain products that we hear out there. And pretty soon the bacteria get used to it and they really don't last. There's products out there today with great research that show that on 18 months trials that, that, that you know, the ability to reduce that methane is real and it can be up to that 40%. Mm -hmm. And um, the other area that I think is really exciting is the genetic side or the genetic side. I, I just had uh, Team Technologies, which is one of our companies that deals in our in our semen and, and holds a lot of the patents on, on protecting semen. Uh, their, their research group just presented to us, uh, and and they're very focused on being able to start selecting through their genomics on feed conversion. And they have a model right now that I was very impressed with. They'll take a static herd that you know has whatever uh, feed ratio, maybe a 1.6, which means you know so much milk for so much feed, and uh, over a five-year period they can reduce that by almost 9%. So uh, uh, reduce the amount of feed while keeping static the amount of milk. Obviously the milk's gonna go up because genetics are gonna improve every year, but it's the model, if you look at the model and you take a static moment and apply that over a five year period of generations, you actually drop uh, feed intake by that much. So that you're increasing you know, the amount of milk per pound of feed, therefore, the amount of methane being produced per pound of feed has dramatically decreased. And then the big one, I think, uh, I don't, I haven't seen enough numbers on this, but but in sheep, the numbers are, that I've seen are pretty impressive. I don't know what the variability is on cows, but not all cows produce the same amount of methane or belts the same amount of methane to produce the same amount of milk. And through genomics, once we start identifying this, we'll also start identifying that without affecting productivity. Uh, and be able to identify that. So by balancing rations properly, by using feed additives, by feed conversions, and by being able to find those uh, through genomics, finding these cows that produce uh, less methane, I could see a cow today, a reduction, if I added all that together, I, I'm not afraid to say somewhere between 60 and 70% reduction 
So if I get my digester and I double up with uh, substrates into the, the amount of uh, methane that I'm producing to offset fossil fuels, I get to apply that against the other 30% that I wasn't able to reduce, right? So all of a sudden, I don't have a methane problem on a dairy, if you follow all that. And then from the feed side, we talked about sequestration. So it's exciting. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really going to hope for the, for the next five, seven years. Uh, obviously, this is a scale business right now. Uh, but but uh, one, and I'll shut up here in a second. I'll say one more thing. It's real important because, again, I shared that it's going to take all dairy farmers together to get to net zero, small, medium, and large. And, and everyone can really do something to reduce. Everyone can do a lot to reduce. So, you know, it, it's that, that effort together. But, but the fact that digesters and, and, and clean technology to clean biogas to methane, you know, to take it from that 60% methane as a biogas to a pure natural gas at 99% methane, that type of technology, technologies that really will give us uh, actual potable water and a dry fertilizer and aqueous ammonia, which those technologies exist today. They're starting, they're, they're, they're gonna be very exciting over the next five years. We need some scale, but what happens with technology, that we all know this, is that you start with something that you need scale, but you immediately start driving out capital cost you start driving out cost of operations and you start driving up efficiency. And what does that do? It takes a, a dairy that's 2,000 cows that could afford this and enough of us do that and we'll figure out how to get that same technology down to a 500 cow dairy, down to a 200 cow dairy with time. So, but this is all an evolution going on and this is why I am so comfortable, uh, not only that everyone can do something today, together we can all do so much, it's that we are going to continue to work together as an industry and be able to uh, to make, you know, create these technologies and everything where everyone can adapt, the systems that everyone can adapt. But again, it's going to take a policy changes, a different frame of mind. It's going to take incentives. It's going to take innovation to create new products, all these and new technologies. So. Uh, and again, I, I, I'm 100% with Frank. I think California has showed us the way. Uh, so goes California, so goes the country in many things. And uh, I think we're, we're starting to see legislation similar to the low carbon fuel standards, I think in seven different states right now that are pass passing similar legislation. And that's a very good thing to be able to allow uh, farmers to have that incentive to invest in these type of practices. Mike, you mentioned that you could see a very strong reductions, methane reductions to occur in the near future. And I completely agree. If we were to achieve, if we were to achieve a 20% reduction of methane, I think which is very moderate, if we were to achieve that, then that reduction of methane would have a negative warming impact, meaning a cooling impact, counteracting nitrous oxide and other gases to a point where the dairy sector with 20% reduction would be largely climate neutral. If we were to get to 50, 60 something, you know, to that kind of percentages, then the dairy industry would actually not only not contribute to warming in a negative sense, but it would actually be a solution provider counteracting some of the fossil fuel related warming emissions. And so to me, uh, agriculture is uh, on a very exciting path, one that um, one that will completely change the narrative that we are all reading about day in, day out. I, I also want to say this one thing. Uh, why would farmers be interested in this? Why would it matter to a normal farmer, uh, you know, how much methane their cow produces if they're not regulated on it? Well, if a cow belches methane, then that's a net loss to energy. It's a net loss to the pocketbook of the farmer because that is energy that this animal is just wasting. Okay, in addition to being a uh, environmental burden, it is also a financial burden because this is just feed that's feed energy that's going off in, you know, in smoke, so to say. Okay, so um, I think um, reduction of greenhouse gases has also, in, in addition to the environmental. Uh, uh, significance it has, it also has a financial uh, uh, benefit to the producer. And so it's a win-win to reduce these gases.
No, I appreciate what, oh, sorry, Clay. I was just going to say, I appreciate what you're saying about, you know, there being a financial incentive. I think there's something else, right? I mean, agriculturalists, dairymen, they just have the propensity. It's in, it's in their DNA to just do the right thing, right? So that's why I think they're going to do it as well, because it's just the, the right darn thing to do. Anyway, I'll get off my, my, my soapbox there, but I wanted to circle back, uh, Clay, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go here in a second. Um, uh, on, on, on a real quick thing, you, you talk about um, you know reducing methane and having a, a, a cooling effect and offsetting you know the the impacts of fossil fuel. Can we really put the genie back in the bottle? I mean, we've been liberating uh, carbon that's been sequestered for million, millions of years, and we've been spewing it out into the atmosphere to, for 200 years, and we, we, we keep doing it more and more every day. I mean, that's isn't that the real problem? I, I mean... I, that is the real problem. Yeah, that is, and so... That is the 800-pound that is the 800 pound gorilla. Globally, humankind puts approximately 50 gigatons of greenhouse gases into the air. The vast majority of that is caused by fossil fuel use. So if we want to stop the earth from warming we have no alternative than to get co2 down to almost zero okay this is why everybody's talking about net zero for for co2 for methane we don't have to do that we don't have to bring methane to zero we just have to stabilize it if we stabilize methane emissions without any reduction if we just stabilize it then that methane does not cause additional additional warming okay if we increase methane, that's a big problem. And currently, by the way, we are seeing that in parts of the world, particularly the developing world, where increasing demand, um, nutritional demand in those populations drive herd sizes to grow. And where that happens, we see more methane from livestock. So that is a trend that we try to reverse. But in most developed countries, and certainly here in the United States, we see the opposite happening, namely that our herd sizes have shrunk over the last 50, 60, 70 years. We produce food with much fewer animals, um, but we are producing way more food from them. For example, on the dairy side, we used to have 25 million dairy cows right around the time when I was a little boy. Okay, 25 million dairy cows. Today, we have 9 million dairy cows, so a much smaller herd, but we are producing 60% more milk. The carbon footprint of a glass of milk in the United States has shrunk by two thirds throughout my lifetime. Two thirds. Okay, so that is truly amazing. And uh, this is not something that that is a PR argument. Or so that's that's reality. Okay, that's where we stand today. Um, and this success story could be one that could be replicated in other parts of the world. I just told you we have 9 million dairy cows in the United States. In India, they have 300 million dairy animals, both dairy and buffalo, 300 million. They could produce the same amount of milk as they do now with 10 times fewer dairy animals. If they were to make improvements to veterinary care, to the feed sector, to the genetics they use, uh, the reproduction and so forth. And I think this is really called for now because uh, these developments in parts of the developing world are responsible for 80%, 80 percent, eight zero of the global livestock impacts. This is not me pointing fingers, okay? This is not me saying we are doing things right and other people in, in these poor countries don't. This is just me pointing out that there are significant opportunities that we have to uh, foster and assist others with. So Frank, from a from a dairy nutritionist perspective, uh, what can a nutritionist do to help reduce carbon emissions on the dairy? So in general, um, it's mostly around methane. Okay, the whole, the whole issue is mostly around methane, also nitrous oxide to some extent, but methane is the 800 pound gorilla. And here, the more roughage is in the diet, the more methane animals produce because the methanogens in the rumen, those methane forming microbes, they thrive off roughage. So you can't really mess a lot with the concentrate to, uh, to, to roughage ratio, but you can fluff around with uh, the process that generates methane. It's a three uh, enzymatic step. You can disrupt that. You can disrupt that. There are certain feed additives now available 
we, you know, 100 were tested. We did a lot of this here at UC Davis. Uh, 100 feed additives that were claimed to be effective for methane were tested. Of the 195 did not work. Some people call that fufu powder, okay? 95 out of the 100 did not work. But the five that did work worked really well. The problem is only one of the five is commercially available right now. The other four are in various steps of scientific uh, R&D, okay? But in five years, they will all be available. And I cannot tell you right now at, at what cost point and so on, but they will be available. And we have seen reductions from 10 to 60% enteric emission reduction. That's just, that's just unbelievable. And what's also really unbelievable is that some of those things significantly foster performance of those cows, components and efficiencies. So that in itself would pay for the, for the, for the product. But on top of that, they reduce methane intensity by 10, 20, 30 or more percent. A no-brainer, really, and a very cost-effective no-brainer. While, let's say, anaerobic digesters, covered lagoons and so on, are a very good public investment in reducing the state's or a nation's carbon footprint, feed additives are even better with respect to uh, the financials. So, so are there other states that are mimicking what California is doing as far as uh, incentivizing the methane reduction and so forth? You know, I I know of you know, Maine's has some some programs that are good. Uh, Vermont has some great program. Like I said before, I think Oregon, Colorado, several others have legislation that they're looking at to mimic similar uh, programs like California has. But uh, truly, California is leading the way on this. Uh, there's some federal stuff also that we're looking at that we could achieve that could help uh, the whole process. So, you know, the, the way that, that our drugs are feed additives versus a drug is looked at. Uh, once it gets classified as a drug, the cost to produce that product is, is a lot higher than if it's a feed additive. How, right. we, how we judge uh, what is a feed additive and what is a drug, I think, uh, could be modernized. Uh, I think that uh, we should take some new looks at that. Frank can speak to this better than I can, but if a product is, is being used inside of the digestive tract and it's and it's breaking down into the natural components through its process of breaking it down and not, none of it gets absorbed into the body and none of it is defecated and it causes a benefit in its process as a feed additive, I mean, that's a pretty clear definition to me of something that should not be classified as a drug. And we're having issues with that. So we, you know, on a federal basis, we need help. Um, uh, you know, our people in, in our departments, I think, are excellent. I mean, I've worked with so many great, you know, great science, great, great people all over. But I think that we need to modernize our thought process a little bit. Now, I'm not saying at all, and I want to make this very clear, that we should ever, ever put at risk safety or Efficacy. Those those are two important components that our agencies take very good care of. And I'm very proud that I live in this country and that we have these type of agencies doing that. But we do need to look around the world of how other people are doing things uh, and and how they're expediting this. Uh, there's countries that are going to be using some of these feed additives three, four, five, six years before we will be able to. You know, that's not a good thing for us farmers. I mean, we we need want support from from our agencies to relook at this and, and reconsider how they're going to evaluate these uh, products and expedite their usage. I mean, we all lived through a, an amazing thing this last year. I mean, I'm, I'm 70 years old and I got vaccinated already. So, uh, you know, I would have never, if you would have told me a year ago that I was going to be vaccinated today for COVID, I would have told you you needed your head exam. But what did we do? We changed our system. We really looked at it. We, we modernized it. We expedited it. And look where we're at. Uh, I'm not saying that trying to compare this to COVID, but this is a very serious problem. Climate change and, and, and having tools to reduce these things is important. So we need to look at them very seriously. We need to uh, rethink how we're approaching it. We have the ability to do it. We have the brilliance within our agencies to be able to make these decisions. We, we This is a top-down request. This is a top-down request that has to be come from our leadership, just like what we saw happen, happen with the COVID vaccine. That was a top-down push. Uh, we need a little bit of a top-down push here. I completely agree. I mean, we have enormous opportunity. On the manure side, we have them 
on the cow side, the enteric side. Um, we have them on the uh, healthy soil side. We know um, that we can make huge strides, but some of those barriers still exist. You know, there are regulatory uh, barriers. There are, there are barriers that make it almost impossible for a company that has something that works to get it into the market. Um, and there are also some some rules and regulations that are just un or considered unfair. So uh, there, there are certain feed additives that are sold as grass, generally recognized as safe. They don't have to undergo FDA review and so on. They are just assumed to be safe. Uh, and then there are others that might have been uh, you know, engineered, um, but as Mike said, they might just stay in the digestive tract and not go into the tissue and so on. And they have to undergo a $4 million FDA uh, approval process that takes four, five, six years. Uh, I have done some of these testing here in, in Davis at UC Davis. Now I can tell you this FDA approval process is incredibly detailed and so on. And it's important for it to be, to result in products and services that are safe. Um, but we need to expedite. It's, it's really important. Time is of the essence. Our farmers are ready. And, um, and I think our, our administration is ready too. When I listen to the Biden team and uh, their goals for agriculture, I hear interest in supporting digesters, uh, investing into healthy soil research and implementation and so on. So I hear some, some, really, good, um, some really good signals there. I do as well. I, I really want to support what you just said, because I, I, I see very, very positive that we're going to advance this quite a bit. Kind of going in a little bit of a different direction is that we see uh, some of the, the nut milks taking some market share away from milk and real milk. And just kind of curious if you've got an understanding or a feel for uh, their ability to, uh, to get to net uh, zero carbon emissions. In that competition, I feel pretty good. It's going to be hard for, for an almond tree to get a digester going. The, the manure digester component is just a huge component. When you double your gas, you offset fossil fuels, you eliminate the uh, methane that was going to atmosphere, all the stuff we talked about here, and then you are fa a farmer and you can survive the way we can. Uh, we truly can get to net zero. I, I think it's going to be very difficult for if, if we're just talking greenhouse gases against greenhouse gases uh, as we develop everything we've been talking about here tonight. Um, I, I feel very positive in that race. I, I know who I, I'm going to bet on and I'm going to bet on dairy farmers. It is a, a complicated topic. First of all, you know, these are all farmers producing different commodities and, and you know, if people seek choices, then I think everybody here will agree people should be able to make whatever choices they, uh, they desire. Um, when it comes to comparing products, let's say real milk to nut beverages, I don't call them nut milks because nuts don't lactate it. But uh, <clears throat> when comparing them, um, then it's not just about carbon. Okay, so for example, I saw a study that compared dairy milk to uh, almond almond juice, and uh, it found that the dairy milk had a ten times higher carbon footprint, but it had a seventeen time lower water footprint. So now you have to make a trade-off decision, okay? So do you go for the product that, that is favorable with respect to carbon emissions, or do you go with the product that's favorable with respect to water footprints? If you, stay, if you live in a state like I do, which is uh, severely water-deprived, uh, water-deficient, then I tell you, uh, you have to think long and hard, long and hard. Uh, I want to tell you this, though. Um, what I read today was another study that was also very interesting. We have almond orchards all over the place now here in California because farmers can, can sell for high prices. A lot of our almonds, by the way, go to China. The Chinese are crazy about uh, our nuts. They go nuts over our nuts, so to say. Um, what's, interesting, what's interesting is uh, that an LCA was done for California's almond nut production. And uh, if these nut producers were to use the healthy choice um, methods of um, they don't till, so no till, uh, using compost, using a whole orchard uh, composting at the end of the lifetime of that orchard and so on, then our, our almond orchards would reduce 10 million metric tons of, of greenhouse gases per year. 10 million metric tons. 
That's a huge amount. And the way they do that is because they are trees, they suck carbon out of the air, it goes through the roots in the soil, and then it's stored in the soil. So that's called carbon sequestration. And as long as we don't burn the orchard after its uh, lifetime, uh, that carbon will not go back into the atmosphere. So um, they can also do a really good job. And um, and I think, you know, when I when I compare dairy versus these alternatives, yeah, it might be true that people drink a little bit less milk, fluid milk these days, but they eat more yogurt and they eat more cheese and so on. That compensates for a lot. You guys, I, I'm, I'm extremely encouraged by what I'm hearing tonight. And, and, and I find myself wondering is, is 2050 aggressive enough? I'm in my 60s. I'd love to see this, right? Try to stay healthy, drink more milk, drink more fair life milk, and maybe I will. But I have to ask the question, is it aggressive enough? Can we get there quicker? You know, I, I like I said earlier, I think our 2050 was, uh, you know, it's a, it's a something that we're going to achieve. I believe we'll be able to achieve it before that time. Starting to truly understand all this newer technology, we're starting to really see these incentives starting to understand new practices. There's a lot that has happened in the last 10 years uh, from where, where we were to where we are today. And we all know that that process is a snowball effect. The next five years, we'll, we'll produce more than we did the last 10 years and the five years after that more. So if you apply that thought process, uh, I think I think we will beat that, that date by quite a bit. Uh, I'm, I'm very, 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 very optimistic that we'll We'll beat it by quite a bit. And I agree with you. Right? It, you know, 2050 is too long. We, we need to get on this. This is uh, something that is important because of the effect, but it's also important in the eyes of our consumer. Cows have got a terrible, bad rap out there for many reasons. We know people that attack us that use things to, to be able to uh, exaggerate and convince people of things that aren't true and misconceptions. It, it's something that we as an industry are very aware of and we know that we need to do everything we can to be able to communicate to our consumers the effort that dairy farmers are doing. I mean, what Frank just shared a little while ago, is how impressive is that? Reduce our carbon footprint by 66% from the 50s to today to, to the 2000. And what in the last, we just finished some research that just got published and shows that we reduced it by another 20% since 2000 and I think it's eight to, to 2017. That's going to accelerate at a, at a great rate here in the future. And, and we, we need to communicate that very clearly. I mean, that's something that, that uh, from a, the plant beverages and synthetics and other things that we all beverages. I mean, we milk is, a, is competes against all beverages. I think it's a great story. It's an amazing story. I think the dairy industry is doing a great job of starting to get that story really organized well with all of the new technologies and systems that we're using and, and our ability to go out there and communicate is improving dramatically. Now that story is something that, that we need to be able to keep our markets and, and be able to compete, and grow our, you know, not, not lose any well milk. I, I agree with, with Frank that, you know, we grow at 1% a year, our, our milk sales, and we grow them very heavily in cheese and yogurt and everything else. But, you know, I, I'm still, you know, fair life milk is an example that uh, we don't have to lose milk sales. We just have to kind of, um, you know, rethink what the consumer really wants and, and put behind it everything that uh, that consumer is looking for. And, you know, they're looking for environmental. They want to believe and they want to understand what we're doing. They, they care about animal welfare. They care about the nutrition of milk. I mean, when you listen to what Frank said a little while ago about the comparison with almond, I don't know, Frank, if that was done on, on a nutritional density comparison, because I think if it was done on nutritional, it would even been, you know, yeah. higher, and that, even more impressive if we would have done it on a nutritional density. So that communication is one that uh, we are aggressively approaching also in the dairy industry to be able to combine, you know, our, our nutritional value. There's just nothing more nutritious than milk out there. I mean, it's, a, it's a, an incredible food. You know, it has nine essential ingredients, so I would add fat. Today is an essential ingredient and call it 10 because we know the value of the fat in milk. But then there's, you know, 30 some micro ingredients that we know about and we know their effects that are just phenomenal. So so that communication about this nutrient value that milk has is, is something that uh, we, we, we continue to push. 
but it has to go with the environmental story. It has to go with the animal welfare story. It has to go with our employee story. It has to go with our community. Every, the impact of dairy farm in America is phenomenal. What, 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 we, what we achieve in rural America, no, no one has the impact that dairy farmers have. And we participate intimately with, with our community. And our employees are just fabulous families and people that are part of, you know, as we grow, they, they, they're employees. It's not just a family operation anymore, but they are family of our dairy farmers and, and they're part of our communities as well. So really that whole package that, that we as a dairy industry are, are out there communicating and sharing and we need to continue to do that to uh, assure our place at the at the table. When you started uh, with, the, with the last segment here, you mentioned... Um The impact uh, that dairy has on on on, on climate and uh, and I was reminded of what I read just uh, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, the the latest EPA emission inventory came out for the United States. It's called Sources and Sinks Greenhouse Gases. And um, when you read that emission inventory, the EPA emission inventory, you will find that the dairy sector contributes to 1.2 percent of direct emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. The beef sector 2.2 so the reason why I say these numbers, 1.2%, that's the official EPA number. Okay? And that's not an LCA, not a life cycle derived number, but that's direct emissions. Uh, that's the way that the EPA compares different sectors to one another. So 1.2% is the official number for the United States. 80%, 80, is the official number for the main fossil fuel sectors. So while it is important that the livestock sector appreciates their own contributions, and sets goals for further reductions. We have to keep our eye on the price. And the eye on the price is clearly on the 800 pound gorilla, which is a reduction of fossil fuels. That's not to say that we shouldn't aggressively pursue reductions in dairy and beef and others, but it's important to infuse some numbers. The LCA numbers for the United States, meaning cradle to grave contribution of the entire dairy supply chain is slightly over 2%, okay? And the reason why I bring this up is because there's so much fear mongering out there, particularly on social media, saying your cows are killing the climate. And uh, if you drink milk or eat butter, even worse, or eat a burger, then that's killing the planet. And it's just it is just ridiculous. And I think it's dangerous. Why is it dangerous? It is dangerous because it's a smokescreen that distracts us of what really affects the climate. Okay. And I'm not at all saying we shouldn't uh, do our homework on the animal agriculture side. I'm, I'm strongly in, uh, in favor of that. But by overblowing it, we are setting a smoke screen distracting us from the major polluters. And that's dangerous just for our climate. And that will get us nowhere. You know, and, and a lot of this happens uh, from different perspectives or different interest groups. You know, there are a lot of people that are just against animal protein. And, and they'll use things like what Frank just described and blow it out of proportion and create these misconceptions that, um, you know, we need to communicate back that these are misconceptions. This is wrong. The numbers are like or what Frank just shared with. I'd like to just say something that I don't know how much sense it makes or not, but I, I always like to, I, I think about it a lot. And, and it's along Frank's point that, you know, the, the 800 pound gorilla, it, it's not, agriculture but we need to do our part i'm 100 i think we, both frank and i have been very clear that we're focused on everything we can do to do to help the industry do its part but when you think of when climate supposedly was perfect let's say the 1700s and i don't know 200 parts per million of co2 in the atmosphere there were 80 million buffaloes roaming around And you talk about where methane comes from, it comes from bad forests, and that's what those guys ate, right? And uh, I mean, that, they didn't get it grain. They, they, it came from the methanogens trying to break down with the hammer and chisel, the type of prairie, dry prairie food that they were eating most of the time. So the amount of methane coming out of those animals was, was part of a beautiful climate. And today we don't have more ruminants in, in this country than, than we're back then, but we're willing to do our part. You know, we're going to say, we didn't start, we didn't cause the problem. You know, as a, we didn't start the fire as the Billy Joel song goes, but, but you know, we're, we're willing to do our part. But it's funny how we get accused of being the problem. And, you know, if you look at the trajectory of history, they are what created part of what made the atmosphere perfect. 
it's other things that created the problem. I always like to kind of think about that that way. And, okay. Well, Mike, you're absolutely right. I, I have uh, I have recently read a period paper on that topic and uh, uh, might interest you. So nobody really counted the, the bison and so on at that time, obviously. But the estimate 60 to 80 million that lived in pre-European settlement times, plus 40 million antelopes. So approximately 100 large ruminants lived in pre-European settlement times. Today, we have 90 million beef cattle and 9 million dairy cows, so approximately 100 million again. So you're absolutely right. The number of large ruminants that roamed the prairies and, and or that are housed on farms today has not really markedly changed. And the, the scientific publication I saw estimated both the wild versus the domesticated contributions to methane, and they were very similar. So, and again, this is not deflecting of responsibility that we have today. That's not at all that, what it is, but it is to show that what we see in the atmosphere today is largely a result of a large amount of extraction of carbon from the ground. They're called fossil fuels, they're oil, coal, and gas, and that's plant and animal material that decayed, that died and decayed and fossilized hundreds of millions of years ago. And over the last 70 years, 70 years, we have extracted half of that carbon from the ground, we have burned it, and now it's in the atmosphere. And that's where your CO2 is coming from, from our incredible use of ancient carbon that was stored in the ground for so long, and now we are putting it into our atmosphere. So gentlemen, uh, I don't know if you heard them or not, but they just called last call. I'm going to have another round. I'm not going to, I'm going to uh, cut the bourbon back. I want to have what you're having, Mike, uh, for this next time oh, okay. around. So. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Excellent. So as we wrap it up here, guys, uh, two things that our audience ought to take from the discussions tonight. If I could get two things from each of you. You know, I, I would say that uh, I, I speak to the dairy industry, but I think agriculture in general, the trajectory of agriculture, specifically in dairy, has always been sustainability. I mean, you look at the, at the at how we've taken care of the land, how we have been more productive, how we have done so much more with less. I just think it's a phenomenal story. Today, I think we aren't only following that trajectory. We have kind of created an enzymatic reaction, if I may say, if I may use that word, to accelerate our ability to efficiency as far as, as our carbon footprint. You know, we were going to get there sooner or later because the trajectory has always been there but but dairy farmers have come together since that meeting i shared with you in 2007 made a commitment as an entire industry we're just not going to continue at the pace of the past we are going to invest in ourselves to accelerate this pace and this snowball effect that i shared with you early is real and, and I've lived it. I've been involved, deeply involved in this since 2007, you know, and, and I love I love all my colleagues, but there's a lot of naysayers and like in any industry. And there's a lot, a lot, lot less today than there were in 2007. Believe me, been able to share and, and they've understood and they're embracing this and more and more are embracing it. And that snowball is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, and join in. If you're a dairy farmer listening, and because I think we've hit all the points from the right thing to do, uh, Scott, that you mentioned very clearly, and I agree 100 percent, that's who dairy farmers are, to uh, our consumers who, who are very concerned about climate and everything in between. We, we are on the right trajectory. We're going to get there. We're going to accomplish this, and we're going to accomplish it a lot faster than, uh, we, than people think we will. I have to say I totally agree with you. So when, when I uh, look at the industry from where I am, so I sit in the ivory tower here, I'm looking at the industry. I'm not obviously a dairyman, but I spend a lot of time on dairies researching emissions and so on. I talk a lot to, to farmers and with farmers. I also talk a lot to students and just uh, consumers and so on. And, and, and and what I what I take away is first of all that the heart of those farmers I talk to are on the right spot. They are committed to doing what what is needed. They're oftentimes, unfortunately, not willing to really step uh, step up and communicate what they do. Okay, many farmers say I'm a private person. I'm a you know I know what I'm doing. I'm doing it well, but I don't really want to talk to the media or I talk to anyone. And I think that's a mistake. I think that farmers should at least talk to their communities about how they do farming. 
uh, when they hear people making claims, wild claims, incorrect claims about antibiotics in milk and pus in milk and this and that and the other, then people need to step up and say, look, uh, here is the reality. Here's what I do. I'm a farmer. Um, and I care. I care. I think the pork industry was the one that had a slogan. That slogan was, we care. And you won't believe how important that is, that the industry shows that they care more than anybody else about the sustainability of what they do. In the, in the past, they called that stewardship, okay? Being the best steward for the land that they manage, being the best steward of the animals that they have control over, being the best steward of the people they work with, the finances they operate with, as well as, of course, also the safety of the products that they uh, that they that they produce. Um, show that you care. Show that you care. This is your legacy. This is your legacy that some people take into the crosshairs, and you have to show that nobody else cares more about any of that than you. And last not least, the most effective people I have I have ever met in agriculture were those who shared their authenticity, okay, their authenticity. When people ask them questions, they didn't try to greenwash, they didn't try to, you know, creatively account or so, but they but they just explained to what they did. One dairyman, I, I want to share that one story here. I found it really interesting. Um, I met a dairyman uh, at the end of a talk I gave at a large meeting, and I noticed, uh, I recognized his name immediately from my Twitter activities. I'm on Twitter and he's on Twitter. And, uh, and I recognized him as a dairyman who has a lot of tens of thousands of followers. And I asked him, well, how do you do that? How do you become such a celebrity, so to say? And he said one word, authenticity. He said, for example, last week I had a case where um, a cow had dystocia. A case of dystocia couldn't you know, give birth very easy. And so he went into the, into the barn and he tried to help that calf uh, to be born. And uh, he was in there for hours. The herdsman was there. Finally, he called his father, and the father came out too. And and they uh, they worked on that cow for hours. And they went into the cow. They turned it around. They couldn't, uh, you know, there was no natural born uh, birth, and so they had to pull the calf. The calf was dead. During the process of doing it, the mother died too. So actually a sad story, right? And a, a frustrating story. And he said, I was really frustrated. We worked for hours and hours all night because we cared for that calf, we cared for that cow, and both of them died. Mm -hmm. the next morning he said, I went on Twitter and I wrote about that. Tens of thousands of people replied. And they weren't in shock and they weren't uh, you know, upset or so, but they, they cared for the way he cared and for the way he described that. And you know what? We, we really have to put some thought into, into what I just said. Authenticity really matters. You as a farmer have to yeah. show that you care and how you care. It's your legacy, and uh, you have to do that job. People like myself can assist you in a scientific way of giving you the right tools and so on, but you have to show that you care. Beautiful, Frank. Beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. What a great way to end. Gentlemen, this has been a treat. It's been enlightening. It's been encouraging. I've enjoyed spending time with you guys. And just I just thank you for, for joining us here tonight. And and you're welcome anytime. Clay and I get together uh, here every couple of weeks. And so <laughs> feel free to join us anytime. And I'd also like to thank our loyal listeners for stopping by once again and to spend some time with us here and listening to these important issues in agriculture. On your way out, if you feel like it, drop us a five star and uh, hit the subscribe button and you'll continue to get alerts to future podcasts. And if you're so inclined, we always enjoy getting a, a glowing review. Our scientific conversations continue at the Real Science Lecture Series of webinars. To register, visit balchemanh.com slash real science to see upcoming events and past top. We hope to see you here next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. Mm -hmm.